going to do a hybrid panel this morning because we've got uh, some panelists here. Very much. Is the mic working? It's working. Is this working? It's working. Um, and we've got one person joining, joining us on Zoom. So um, just to introduce everybody, Adam Matthews is joining us on Zoom, hopefully shortly. Adam is the Chief Responsible Investment Officer for the Church of England Pensions Board. He's also the chair of the $40 trillion supported Transition Pathway Initiative. He's a board member of the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change and chair of the Mining and Tailing Safety Initiative. So hopefully he will pop up on screen soon. Um, Andrew Lindsay has worked in the mining industry his entire career. Over the years, he's worked in various companies in copper, nickel, gold, potash, and coal. And he now heads Antifagasta's office in London, where he is responsible for the company's investor relations activities. It's also interesting to note that uh, at the start of his career in the 80s, he, he worked on an electric vehicle battery project, so ahead of his time, which was a joint venture between Anglo and AEG, now Daimler. Ayuna Nachaiva, on my left here, is head of Europe primary markets at the London Stock Exchange Group. Ayuna focuses on deal origination and client relationship management with pre-IPO and listed companies across Europe, including those from the mining sector. And George Cheveley, George has uh, been a portfolio manager at 91 for 15 years. He runs their gold equity strategy and co-manages their diversified resources strategy. Immediately prior to 91, he was the base metals analyst at BHP in Singapore covering copper, lead, zinc, and gold. He started his career in South Wales for British Steel, buying tin, then joined CRU where he was initially researching steel markets and then transitioned into managing their copper research. So welcome everybody. Um, Andrew, oh, there we are. Okay, so we have Adam. Adam, uh, I'm gonna kick, kick things off with you. Um, in the previous discussion, the issue of COP26 uh, was discussed, but it would be very interesting to get your perspectives on the headline impacts that you think COP26 will have on the mining sector. Well, thank you, thank you very much um, for inviting me to join the panel. And I mean, COP26 obviously didn't conclude a set of government commitments that yet match one and a half degrees, but it's getting closer. And obviously, that in turn informs investors and our relationship with companies that, that we own. So the expectation that we continue to see action from companies, from the finance sector, will remain and continue to grow significantly as we build up to the next COP. So net zero is still alive. The announcement from the UK government, for example, that companies will need transition plans they made that at the COP. I think that will become a standard expectations across the whole sector. And investors will really closely uh, relate to the credibility of those plans as to whether they can support them, but equally support the directors that have put them forward. A second area for the COP that was significant was obviously the language around phase out, phase down of coal, whatever it finally landed on. Um, clearly, that, that that is on a path to been removed from the energy system. Um, but there's a reality. Large parts of the world still are dependent on coal and need credible um, plans to manage that transition away. And I think the thing for me that was really interesting um, was the funding that was put on the table, the public funding from the UK, the US and Europe for South Africa to support South Africa's NDC and its delivery. And there I think you've got a reality of an energy system that's based on coal um, and you need that kind of ground up innovative solution almost across multiple countries that can enable an energy transition at the national level and face the reality that it is still coal dependent at the moment, the energy system there, but there is a way here to put public money on the table and then hopefully bring considerably more pub private money behind it that I think can enable South Africa to deliver on its transition in a just way. And then I think the last point really for me is just 
the dependency on the transitional mining. Um, my fear remains that there are a number of issues that challenge the mining sector and the sector is absolutely integral to the transition, both in terms of that negative aspect related to coal, but equally the positive aspect. And there are issues such as tailings, such as automation, such as indigenous community rights that threaten the role of the sector. And there is a path here that investors really need to tread with the mining sector to address these systemic challenges. Otherwise, I think it will be a very difficult path and the world needs the mining sector to produce the metals and minerals for the transition. And these issues have got to be addressed. Otherwise, it will undermine that objective. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and from our perspective, we're very committed to working with the industry to play in our part. Thank you, Adam. That's certainly been a strong theme this morning, you know, the importance of the mining sector to this whole transition. Coming to Andrew. Um, Andrew, it would be interesting to know how you've seen the decarbonisation energy transition agenda change at uh, the board level of mining companies over the past year. Um, thanks, Brandon. Um, I think going back a bit more than the last year, but the, it's, been a, it's been a gradual process actually for many, many years. I mean, at Antofagasta we produced our first sustainability report in 2007. We probably formed our sustainability committee some 10 years ago. Um, and in 2018, we set our first emissions targets, uh, which we renewed uh, earlier this, this year. Um, and during that period, you've seen obviously the, the focus of the board tightening all the way all through those, whatever it is, 15 years or so. Uh, in particular, in Chile, we, we, were, we were living climate change that at the beginning you didn't realise. We, we had a, there's been a drought going on for 12 years. And I actually look back in, over our annual reports over the last 12 years, and you can, you can see us every year talking about the drought. But we only started talking about climate change really in the last few years. Um, just seemed like a bad run of luck or whatever one thought at the beginning. And there was a bit of you know, scepticism about climate change probably you know, 10 plus years ago. Um, now, now it's a key focus of the board. I mean, we have, um, we've just, uh, we set a climate change policy or strategy last year. Um, we've set these emissions targets and we've entered into a series of sort of uh, associations where we're working with other companies, mining companies or suppliers, um, looking for solutions. And in the end, for us, you know, the, the, the challenges are really twofold, just in two areas primarily. It's water availability, that drought, that's, that's what climate change is, is, how it's affecting central Chile. And then of course emissions, and like all mining companies, that's emissions from your, your truck fleet. Um, and so these associations we formed are particularly looking at the solution to the diesel truck fleet. And we're agnostic about the technology that might solve that. We're, one, we're working with some other mining companies and it's looking at electric vehicles, some way that you can quickly swap the battery pack on a truck. Um, and you know, that's a project which we've uh, recently got into. And then we got another one where we're working uh, with um, putting fuel cells into, into trucks and using hydrogen to power them. Um, these are probably both projects will take some time. In the short term, you're probably going to get things like trolley assist and um, and biofuels which will reduce our emissions but the, all these issues come up for the for the board and we look at you know we talk we talk about two things we talk about the adaption and mitigation and where you can you adapt and if you can't you then then mitigate uh, and that's and that's the focus thanks andrew george coming across to you uh, you know with the lens on investment is it a question of understanding risk and opportunity, or are there ESG decarbonisation hard lines that can compromise a project's ability to access capital? Yeah, I think um, if you look back in, um, you know, a few years ago, people were sort of very quick to exclude areas or sectors and say, well, we can't invest in that, there's too much emissions, or, you know, we can't do coal and we can't do steel. Um, because of various, you know, ESG perceived weaknesses. But clearly, as Adam 
pointed out as well, you know, a lot of these things are critical and they can't disappear overnight. And I think now we look at it very much in, in a way, in a more holistic way around the risks to, to these projects um, and, and whether they, they can be sustainable in the long term. Um, and, and how, is there, is there a way we can help them transition, you know, any heavy emitters away from those emissions? And if there is, then there might be a chance to invest in that. So, I mean, we, the way we look at ESG now is um, in a way less quantitative than we used to. We used to sort of score everybody and then compare them. And we realized it was too, too blunt, actually. Um, so now we assess sectors, we assess companies, looking at them from all angles. What are the risks? What are the externalities? How is the company addressing them? Um, and, and really that then informs our investment decisions around that company and what the risks are. And, and at the same time, you've then got a list of risks to talk to the company about and, and see how they can actually reduce those risks, mitigate them, you know, by engaging with them, you know, find out a bit more about how they perceive them, how they think they'll deal with them. And, and that actually becomes a much, and, and then it gives you at the same time then a list of things to watch when you, we've made an investment. Are they, are they meeting these targets? Are they hitting these milestones? that we want them to do. So it, it's, it's maturing rapidly, I would say. It was a very simplistic debate only two, three years ago around ESG, bad, good, and that was it. Um, now it is it's definitely maturing, and when we look at projects, we, we're looking from all angles of where they're coming. But the important thing is, and actually I spoke to a company yesterday even, who said now all projects that come up for approval have to have a carbon impact um, side to the project. In other words, everything now for approval has to show what will its impact be on carbon decarbonisation. And I think increasingly that's what we want to see. Okay, thank you, George. Ayuna, um, it would be interesting to know what initiatives the London Stock Exchange Group are involved in, in terms of promoting decarbonisation and, and the green agenda in mining. Um. Thank you, Brandon. And um, um, Evie, I think, before us, and Mark as well, have mentioned that trillions of dollars will be required to fund the decarbonization and the transition to a low carbon economy. And uh, uh, the public markets and the financial markets, of course, have a huge role to play in that. So London Stock Exchange sits um, you know, at the center of the UK financial, international financial markets as well. And it's really important for us, has always been very important to uh, enable listed issuers, you know, pre-APO companies to have a dialogue with investors and to have, a meaningful, to have meaningful strategies towards this um, decarbonization. So we actually work very closely with the TPI, the Transition Pathway Initiative, of which Adam was, of course, chair. Uh, so we're supporting the TPI um, uh, Global Climate uh, Transition Center, uh, and we're also helping uh, them expand their coverage from 400 to 10,000 companies globally, and to move uh, from equities to fixed income. Another way that we support is, of course, providing services that, um, that um, uh, companies can use, actually both listed and non-listed. For example, uh, transition bonds. So companies need financing to, uh, uh, to, to uh, finance, to fund the climate projects, to fund uh, decarbonization. So a uh, transition bond segment is one where, where companies can raise that, that capital. We have recently issued, actually just before COP26, we issued a new climate, um, uh, climate reporting guidance, which is aligned with TCFD standard uh, task force for uh, climate-related financial disclosure. Um, and that again uh, helps companies to set meaningful um, strategies towards net zero um, and disclose against them. And um, other things include the climate governance core. Actually, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the companies were, want to see where they are at the moment to understand you know, what they, they should do next. So miners, uh, mining companies, metals and mining companies uh, go to our website and use the climate governance score and they can see where, where they do well and where, where there are areas where they can do better. I think what's really important, and uh, Evie also mentioned that um, uh, during the prior panel, is, is to understand um, 
is to, how to put it, to find this just transition. So if we just divest or encourage investors to divest or just sell off the the high carbon assets that are no longer aligned with the company strategies, it may not be helpful. It may not be helpful in emerging markets where there is high reliance on, uh, on um, uh, uh, you know, fossil fuels. Um, it, uh, it is not helpful to, uh, in terms of social impact, where a lot of people may be left without jobs. Uh, if you just do sort of a stress trade, um, you know, irresponsible unwinding of assets. So, so finding that balance where we uh, we support uh, the the companies and and the other and other stakeholders and institutional and retail investors with that um, is uh, is is pretty crucial. So, um, and maybe one final thing is that um, in terms of. Um, uh, you know, climate impact and you know uh, the transition to low carbon economy. Uh, people also uh, uh, often forget about the social and governance parts of the um, uh, of the equation. So it's not just the environment; it is the social impact and how do we support communities. Um, and for example, at the London Stock Exchange, we have the social bonds where you can raise capital. Companies can raise capital to to find so uh, to fund social. Um, uh, projects, but also the governance. And I know we will be talking about governance in a little bit more detail, but just to kind of high level, just to touch on that, um, I think risk management is part of governance, board, um, uh, board composition, uh, uh, introducing a sustainable strategies across the value chain, including at board levels and uh, uh, executive level. Uh, I think that's really important. And Adam also mentioned tailing safety, that kind of is very close, uh, closely connected with that. Certainly the mining industry is facing a, a broad range of ESG challenges. Coming back to you, Adam, um, what do you see as the key challenges going forward and how do you rate decarbonisation as a priority in that mix? Well, th there are a number of challenges that the sector needs to engage with and, and I completely acknowledge that there's lots of good practice in the mining sector. There's companies that have pioneered best practice there's leaders of companies that have really championed addressing difficult issues and embedded that into the way they've operated. But when you're invested across the sector, as many investors are, universal owners, certain issues challenge your ability to invest in the sector, not in individual companies. And that's the way that we look at this sector. And there are a raft of challenges that we feel at the sector-wide level remain insufficiently attended to and for that reason as investors we're working to develop a vision of for 2030 of for the mining sector that really looks to address them there's a direct correlation with these issues and that is issues such as tailings management water management indigenous community rights the impact of automation um, and a number of other issues all of these um, themselves are important are systemic challenges to the sector and at the same time jeopardize the role that the sector needs to play in the energy transition. So decarbonization itself is hugely important. The positive role of the sector for decarbonization is critical, but is also undermined by these issues. And at the same time, the sector's got to decarbonize too. Um, and it needs to have credible transition plans for individual companies and equally within that, ensuring that it captures all of its mission, emissions, scope one, two and three and that there's sort of difficult transition plans put in place that investors can walk and walk behind and support and provide transition finance for. So I don't want to sort of pick out there's this issue that trumps this issue. I think there's a range of them. And the challenge really is that they've all got to be addressed. I do fear that at a sector wide level, there aren't the structures in place at the moment for the, them to be really grappled with, with the depth of ambition and change that's needed. And that's part of the reason why we're, we're working with other investors to develop a 2030 vision for, for the mining sector. We want it to be a supportive one. We do think it's going to have very strong dependency on independent verification that standards of best practice are applied at the site level. And I think what you're seeing in the tailing standard, where you're now moving from having 
developed with ICMM, the UN, and Investor as a global standard on tailings management. We now move into creating an independent global institute, and that institute will play a key role in verifying that that standard's been applied at the, at the site level. And that, for us as, in, as investors, is going to be critical. My sense is there's a model here to work with industry that could be extrapolated across the sector on a range of other issues. Thanks, Adam. George, coming back to you, um, you know, when you consider these issues, are investors, in your opinion, equipped to understand the nuances between countries in different stages of, of development? Um, I, I think this is a, a critical issue. Um, you know, Adam spoke at the start about the um, announcements on South Africa. We obviously our origins a South African company. We have a huge number of people working down there. Sorry, George, could you speak up some of the... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's not picking me up. Yeah, just speak a bit louder. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously being by origin a South African company, we see a huge challenge down there, and it's great to have seen the support that came out from COP. And I think it highlights um, something we've been very keen um, to focus on, which is we can't... We can't reduce, we can't do this by avoiding emissions. We have to reduce emissions. A lot of emissions are coming from emerging markets to produce goods for the developed world. And uh, we therefore can't just invest in developed world companies and say, you know, our portfolio has less emissions. That doesn't work. We have to engage with emerging markets. We have to find ways of helping them reduce emissions and thereby reducing the emissions we import from them. And, and I think. Um, that's critical when we look at the way we invest and, and the companies we invest in uh, and how we can engage with that. I think, as I said at the start, I think the, the, the discussion is maturing. I think COP was great in terms of we heard a lot more people talk about these problems and, and how we might solve them, in the, even at government level and company level. There's still some way to go. I think Adam, again, makes a very valid point, which is you know, you can talk to an individual company and get satisfaction, but if you're a generalist investor, quite often it's just, it's just tough dealing with resources as a sector. It's in many cases not huge in your field, and, and therefore, you know, it's, it's easier to avoid that than really get involved. Um, I think we need to, you know, make sure people understand the relevance. And, and, and you know, it's, it's always amazed me, we, we, all the mining companies, people talk about scope three targets, what's happening with scope three because of the downstream emissions they're going to produce. There's far less focus on consuming companies and their scope three in terms of purchase goods. And I have seen companies who, when they look at their purchase goods, just go back one stage. They don't go back to the raw materials. So if they buy a steel part from somebody, they just look at the emissions that company produces in making that steel part. They don't look at the emissions in the, it's creating the steel. So I think there needs to be, you know, from both ends, from the consumer side, we need to be helping reduce emissions, as well as looking at how resources can. And then we need to be looking across countries and different sectors and different stages of development. And you can't just apply the same criteria for a developed world company or country as you will with the emerging markets immediately. Obviously, we need to get the same place, but that was starting from very, very different levels. Uh, Andrew, just picking that up from a sort of mining operational perspective, you know, how are mining companies operating in diversified geographies managing this challenge? I think the distinction is probably similar to what George is talking about. It's between the sort of developed world where the, uh, the environmental requirements are pretty strict. So obviously, there's a spectrum. And then in the emerging markets where, where there's a less uh, well-formed body of law, maybe. But as a, as a mining company, you know, you, you want to apply a universal global standard. You're not, you're, not, you're not going to a country because it's got, you've got easier legislation. You're going there because it's got the, the mineral that you want to, to mine. Um, but sometimes, of course, you need to be in a supporting environment, which actually makes it easier to achieve that. I'm talking about scope three. I mean, the, the difficulty about scope three is actually knowing what the, what, and as George says, it's not, actually the downstream for a copper producer at least is not 
is not actually the um, sorry the smelters and such are not where the big emissions are. I mean, there are quite substantial emissions there, but actually it's the supplies. And we've been doing work on Scope Three, and we've been a bit surprised to realise how much how much of the Scope Three emissions are actually in our suppliers. And so we've we've introduced as um, we are introducing carbon pricing. We will use it in project evaluation, but we also use it in supplier assessment. And I'm sort of interested to see how this goes, because there are probably some suppliers in this room. But if we come along and say, tell us what your emissions are linked to this product that we're buying from you, um, what your answer is going to be, because <coughs> uh, I'm sure not everyone knows the answer. And even if they do, they probably don't know it with a fair level of position. Again, the order says, you go back to the steel. Does the supplier go back to the getting the steel emissions, or does he only go back one stage further? But this is part of a, this is part of a long process. We're all learning. I guess, you know, we're not quite we're not quite top of the tree, but we're near it, and we're just pushing. We're doing this push down to get the, the to get the sort of mining universe broader than just the industry itself to provide this information. Now that's that doesn't matter which country you're in. Um, it's just universal. I mean, in the specific countries, you may have particular local issues which require you to do things, but this is probably more in permitting permitting requirements and we have an operation so a project in the states and the permitting there is you know incredibly onerous you know and everybody is allowed to say their piece and you have to respond to it formally and then they can you go back and so I mean I would point out Chile probably takes two or three years to get an environmental permit and America probably takes six or seven um, it's a big difference um, but actually our attitude of what we're trying to do is is the same and the other difference is if you're doing a if you're an existing mine or your greenfields. With a greenfields mine, you can build it. I talked about adaption and mitigation. You can do much more adaption if you're building a new mine. So, you know, we'll build our mine in, in America with wholly electrical equipment, you know, from the day one. Because if you know you're going to do that, you can design the mine accordingly. But when you introduce it into existing operation, and the, the whole pit configuration affects whether you can actually use autonomous trucks, for instance. Um, and obviously the next stage to autonomous is then to have um, uh, clean, clean truck technology as well. Um, so there's a, there's a variety, of, variety of considerations, but I think we're all, we're all, making, a, <laughs> we're all making good progress. Thanks, thanks. Some progress. Thanks, Andrew. Um, just with an eye on the time, I think one more question for Ayuna, and then we'll open up to, to the audience. Um, how does the London Stock Exchange promote good governance and disclosure on, on issues related to ESG and decarbonisation. Thank you. Um, I actually, before I, I answer your question, I wanted to mention that Antofagasta, I don't know if you know, Andrew, is the oldest listed company on the London Stock Exchange. You have been listed for over 100 years now, I think. Yeah, 135 or something. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's good to hear that you, you are making a good progress <laughs> because we want to keep you listed. We started early. <laughs> um, but, uh, but if serious, I, uh, if seriously, I, um, um, uh, um, I wanted to cover some of the, uh, maybe touch upon the harmonization and the, and the uh, unified stance that we need to have um, I think it's important that um, there is interoperability of various standards that currently exist and various taxonomy. I think we're not yet there, but we're moving there. In the UK, uh, climate-related uh, uh, climate, uh, disclosure, such as TCFD, uh, is actually a prevailing standard now. Uh, premium listed companies um, actually are required now to, to disclose, um, uh, to report against it, and there is also a, um, and others are, um, uh, politely asked to, to disclose against it on a comply or explain basis. But, uh, and I think we're moving towards um, uh, this be being a sort of a, uh, a central standard that, that will, be, uh, will be adopted by, by most of the companies. Um, I think it's important to, to not over-regulate though. And uh, uh, I think uh, what, what we're seeing now coming from the UK regulator is that um, uh, they're providing guidance and requirements, but uh, not providing really harsh standards, which you know uh, put very, very firm um, limits on what you can and cannot, uh, should and shouldn't say. Uh, and that's really important as well, because as, uh, as some of the other speakers mentioned, uh, all of the companies are at different stages, and a lot of the companies are operating in, in the markets where you know, the legal framework or uh, local taxonomies are not as developed. So for them to, uh, it will take a little bit longer and a little bit more effort to, to, get, uh, to, get, uh, to get there. 
So, um, and what's important is to take these companies on a journey with us, obviously, towards a, um, a, more, a more, more sustainable economy. So, sort of, uh, uh, you know, extreme sort of um, um, uh, extreme regulation or sort of uh, putting, uh, moving those um, uh, companies to the private market where there's actually more opacity and less transparency is not going to help um, um, anyone. Um, on, the, uh, on the governance side, I also wanted to touch on um, diversity. I think that's really important. So um, it's, it, there have been numerous studies and numerous actual examples where we now understand that um, uh, the diversity of thought at board levels actually leads to better decision making and better risk management. So um, uh, ensuring that there are diverse voices, not just in terms of gender, ethnicity, but also you know, where people come from, their social background, um, just providing um, uh, different thought processes to ensure that the group think is challenged, is actually it translates into real, um, uh, real, uh, real um, improvement in, in decision making. And I think for the mining sector is, is really important. I think in some, in some areas, uh, miners have become much more diverse in terms of hiring, in terms of appointing, um, uh, appointing diverse uh, management um, and board members, but I think there is a long way to go. And, um, and that's something that um, I think we're really um, uh, encouraging in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Aina. Um, I think it's a good time to open up some questions to the audience. Um, <coughs> if Andrew's around with his, with his microphone, there, there he comes. Thank you. Um, we've, just, we've heard quite a lot of discussion there um, around scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions um, and what businesses can do within their, within their own value chains. One of the interesting opportunities for the mining sector is that a lot of the, the minerals and a lot of the uh, resources that we're extracting are actually going into end products such as, uh, for example, we work in rare earths, the products that we're going to be supplying into are uh, going into wind turbines and EVs. Um, and one of the things I'd be interested to hear from the panel, particularly from an investment and a governance point of view, is how you would assess those companies who are supplying into these products, but the existing structures and the existing way things are looked at wouldn't necessarily pick that up with our value chain because our scope three emissions wouldn't be reducing through these products because we haven't had products sold into higher emissions assets. So I think the interesting question for us would be just to understand how the panel are picking up the opportunities for companies like ourselves with these, these products that are essential for, uh, for decarbonisation but wouldn't necessarily show up on some of the scope one, scope two, scope three assessments. Is there any particular member of the panel that you would like to answer your question? I think Adam yep. wants to I'm happy to give it a go. Adam, Adam can have a crack at <laughs> I've just seen a photograph of what I look like, some giant monster sitting above the panel. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, picking up on Iona's earlier point about the Transition Pathway Initiative, I mean, at the moment we've been looking at mining companies, diversified mining companies, and We've been looking at all material emissions, and there's a challenge. We, we don't yet have a methodology that can pick up the positive and the negative. And so we do need to further sophisticate the methodologies. Um, we initiated a process a couple of weeks back with investors um, from Climate Action 100 that are leading with the major diversified companies um, to look at how we can evolve the methodology and in effect develop a net zero standard for the mining sector. Um, we've just done that for the oil and gas sector, which goes significantly beyond the, the Climate Action 100 benchmark. And that really picks up on individual nuance. And I think that we, through this process, will be able to sort of acknowledge those positives and some of the sort of difficulties in, in the sector under sort of the simplicity of current methodologies. So, Watch this space, it is, it is acknowledged, um, it's a fair challenge, and I think we're looking at how we can better reflect these, these issues in, in the way that we look at the sector. And I think this will move very fast in the next year. Yeah, I think um, if I could just add to that, uh, the way we look at it, um, investing increasingly in resources companies, is um, companies that we invest across the space, so in oil and gas, for instance, we need to see a very strong 
um, reduction transition plan from those companies. Um, and we don't want to see them just growing more production. We want to see how they're reducing it and how they're going to do it. Otherwise, we find it very hard to invest. For companies, and particularly more junior companies, if they're producing or exploring and looking to produce metals particularly or other commodities which are needed for the transition, we, the way I put it is, is we're going to be more forgiving of those companies if they haven't got a perfect transition plan but with this commodity or if they have high emissions because of where the mine is, where the country is, we will take that into account and we certainly take into account the commodity they're producing when we take it in the round. I mean, and, and increasingly, it's important, we have to. Good. Are there any other questions in the... We've got it. Andrew, over here. Um, I wondered if we could delve a little bit more into that. So, I, both Adam and, and, uh, and George, in terms of investing, supposedly World Bank is saying six billion tonnes of new metal will be required. We all know that most of the growth will come from emerging markets. We all know that there will be need for new mining, which means we will have additional impact on carbon. We will be increasing carbon, not decreasing carbon. In addition to that, we've been relying on, for the last 20 years on China's smelting capacity. If, if we want to look after local communities, if we want to grow local skills, then shouldn't we actually be increasing the carbon footprint of developing countries in order to include having them being part of the mineral processing world and maybe not doing smelting, but doing alternative mineral processing, but in country, rather than, for instance, Latin America, responsible for 50% of copper and yet only 2% of downstream processing. So for me, there's a whole bigger challenge that I don't think people are properly addressing in this conversation on decarbonising, because we will actually need to increase carbon in order to decrease it. And I'm just wondering, Adam, particularly where you're coming from at your very high strategic level, how you see that sitting, please. Well, look, that, that's absolutely fair question and, um, and good challenge. And I think these are the issues that we wanted to grapple with in, in the context of the sort of 2030 investor vision for the mining sector. Um, I, I, um, I, I feel we've got to be much more innovative in the way that we're looking to support the sector as, as investors. Um, colleague from, from 91, I think, is very close to the realities in, in, in a number of countries where I think we're going to be looking at the, those national development plans um, that com countries have. What are the interventions that are needed there? How we can sort of constructively support them? I think that's going to require us to get out of investing in just sort of silos in the way that we currently do. Um, and I think that that's also going to push us to sort of look at the ways that countries could potentially sort of take different approaches here. And we need to have a sophistication in our understanding that enables us to recognize that. Um, so, yeah, I, I just feel that there's a lot of work to be done from us in, in sophisticating the way that we're going to acknowledge the transition, that there's going to be trade-offs here. Um, there may be parts of this transition that companies are producing where we need to acknowledge that they've got a slightly different path. And I think that's the sort of work that we're going to have to go through. Yeah, I think, if I just add to that, I think, um, you know, in, in many cases it comes down to, I mean, a lot of people are now focusing on critical minerals and people are waking up to, you know, some of the concentration, particularly of um, some metals in processing in China, for instance. Um, we've recently had a scare around magnesium supply because of power shortages in China, a hugely power intensive metal to produce. Um, and the answer in some cases is yes, you have to move production or build new production elsewhere. And you're right, any country goes, hang on, but that doesn't comply with my NDCs, I've, I've got to increase my carbon. That is a really tricky problem. All I would say is it is being discussed. I'm not saying it's being solved. I think politicians will have to be involved. I mean, I do know it was discussed at the G7 you know, it is being discussed at high levels. The State Department in the U.S. is taking quite an, you know, fo is now starting to focus on some of these issues. Um, so, but, but I agree with Adam. It's, it, we're a long way from solving it, but I think people are coming more and more aware. And, and I think at a very basic level, if you talk to anyone and say, we need to make this transition, we need to build a lot more renewable power, non-fossil fuel energy supply, 
and that's going to take a lot of minerals and metals, and that might mean we have to increase production somewhere. I think people can understand that logic. It's not a hard thing to understand. We need to make sure some politicians are prepared to use some political capital to make that argument as well. Good, thank you. Well, it looks like we're out of time. So uh, from my side, thank you very much, panelists, for your time and your input. It's been very interesting, a topic we no doubt will talk about a lot over the coming days. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have a huge round of applause for our fantastic panel?